Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Pretty exciting. We have a, a massive number of people who are pre-registered for this event. So that's awesome. So uh, really appreciate it, everybody. So I'm with, my name is Dan Burke, everybody. Nice to see you. And for those of you who have joined us in the past on these Crest Oral-B Oral Systemic Health Series, welcome back. Um, today's a pretty serious topic having to do with diabetes and its connectivity to oral health. But uh, I encourage you, even with a serious topic, feel free to have a little bit of fun with it. Uh, a, because why not? And B, uh, we tend to learn a little bit better when we're sparked. So in one way, we can spark mm -hmm. ourselves a little humor. So won't be a comedy show, because um, I'm just not that funny. But again, uh, I encourage you with uh, the chat to actively participate. We do monitor the chat. Uh, any questions, please shout it out, and I will try to work them in. Or at the end, there will be a Q&A. So housekeeping matters. Uh, for those of you who, to whom this matters, this is CE. So it's uh, one and a half hours, which is great. So thank you, uh, Crest Oral B, for sponsoring that. That's appreciated. And uh, for those who are um, will be getting CE, there's a code that will pop up. It'll pop up at about the 60-minute mark which is when we'll try to transition plus or minus there to, to active Q&A. Uh, so uh, wait for that, that code, you're going to need it, and then you'll enter it in CE Zoom. So I'm going to go over some housekeeping matters. That was kind of one already. So that was just a little sneak peek. And uh, and we'll go through some of those. And then I get a couple of uh, shout outs. We'll introduce our awesome panelists who I, I've gotten to know them. I'm even more impressed with them. Um, and then we'll jump right in. So again, my name is Dan Burke. Nice to meet everybody. I'm the uh, Chief Enterprise Strategy Officer of Pacific Dental Services, and I'm the Vice President of, or a Vice President of the PDS Foundation, which uh, is the vehicle that is uh, sponsoring this as well. So um, here's some of the housekeeping matters. So uh, if this is your first webinar with CE Zoom, which is the platform, there are some rules to follow. So rules are always very important. So again, it's about 90 minutes. So you have to stay on for an hour and 15 minutes. I know we'll try to make it actually entertaining and, and useful. Uh, but you do have to stay on for that amount of time to receive credit for your CE folks. So again, at the end of the webinar, the first 60 minutes plus minus will be popping up that code that you'll need. And then when you log into CE Zoom, uh, that's where you'll see it. Again, all this stuff, you don't need to memorize everything I'm saying, we'll spoon feed it, no worries. Um, so great, so this is a live stream webinar. So you have to have a decent internet connection. So the one thing in chat that we've found is a lot of the chat will start coming in saying, I'm having internet problems. I wish I could fix it. I can't, I can't fix my own internet. I sure can't fix yours. So uh, just so you know, if that is an issue with you, um, you may have to hop out, come back in. Hopefully for none of you, this will matter. For those of you who use, who can use Google Chrome, if you're not, it's much better on Google Chrome. Um, Mine defaults Internet Explorer. It's it's a it's a mess. So I don't use it. But if there, I'll be there soon. I hope. Um, it's so yes, this will be recorded um, and it'll be available on the CE Zoom site. So that's great. That's some housekeeping matters. Um, so some quick thank yous because there's some people behind the scenes who do awesome stuff, and I really appreciate it. So Procter and Gamble again, Crest Oral B. I uh, really appreciate it. Dave Scholl, Andrew G and Greco, and the team. Awesome. Uh, NDA Media is our our producer, Laura Dildy, her assistant, working with hers, Katie Rada. Thanks. Jed Ivy back behind the scenes. A lot of you get all your CE, no Jed on this platform, no Jed really well. Um, he's not a, a, a strange man in the basement. He's just a man in the basement. Uh, Sarah Thiel, team at CE Zoom, really appreciate it. And then just really helping with a lot of this, the American Diabetes, the American Diabetes Association, Molly Durer and the team, thank you. And specifically for connecting us with Dr. Eden Miller, which thank you, Dr. Eden Miller. I'll thank you a lot later. Uh, CDC folks, uh, Nicole Johnson and the team, the Division of Oral Health have been very active um, promoting all this issue. And the National Association for Chronic Disease Directors, Bar Park, thank you uh, and the team for all your work. So let's jump right in. Um, we've got, let me introduce the speakers for you. So first I will introduce you to Dr. Eden Miller. Uh, who, if you haven't heard of her at the end of this, you'll be like, why haven't I heard of Dr. Eden Miller? And you will start following her. So uh, Dr. Eden Miller is an osteopathic board certified pr family practitioner 
She got her MD from Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine in 1997, and she returned to the Northwest, where she completed a residency at East Moreland Hospital in Portland, Oregon. Upon completion, she joined High Lakes Healthcare in Bend, Oregon, where she practices with her husband, Dr. Kevin Miller. And over the past 18 years, she's cultivated a special interest in diabetes after contracting type 1 diabetes while in medical school. Out of that personal experience, her practice has extended into a subspecialty in diabetes care. She's an impassioned speaker. Dr. Miller has given over 1,000 lectures in the field of diabetes to healthcare pro providers and patients alike. By the way, not in her bio, you know, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but you can't stop me now, so there you go. Um, she's also a world-class athlete, and well, I won't put her on the spot, but a pretty, if you Google her, you're gonna be like, really? Like, and then music conductor? I mean, there's a whole thing there, so I wish we had more time, but I may sprinkle some of that stuff in there, Dr. Miller, just because I'm a squirrel. All right, so, but thanks for being here, Dr. Miller. I really appreciate it. You have a thousand things pulling on your time for you to invest your time like this on this subject for this audience. We just really appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Zuli Fernandez, rock star. Uh, Dr. Zuli uh, earned her Doctor of Dental Medicine degree at University of Puerto Rico. She then went on to pursue two years of advanced education in general dentistry at NYU's Langone Medical Center, a terrific place. And in an effort to remain at the forefront of dental medicine, she pursued a specialty training at the world-renowned Mayo Clinic Hospital where she earned dual postgraduate degrees in periodontology and a master's in biomedical sciences. Upon graduation, she received the American Academy of Periodontology Student Achievement Award, the highest award given by the Academy to a graduating periodontal Dr. Eden today. So Dr. Zuli, if you don't mind kicking us off, um, Mayo Clinic, uh, you and I have spoken quite a bit about that, about a, what an amazing opportunity you had uh, to really be in an immersive environment where systemic health was considered maybe obvious, that of course we're all a system, we're not simply body parts. Um, what we'd like, we'd love you to do is sort of set the table on um, something that may be us, the that the mouth is actually connected to the body and how that functions and set the table for us. Uh, following that, uh, everybody, well, I'm going to ask Dr. Eden, just so you have a heads up, Dr. Eden, because it's coming, to do a little bit more of a deep dive on diabetes itself uh, for us, and then we'll get into our, our discussion topic. So, Dr. Zuli, can I hand it over to you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Let's go ahead and get started. With, um, I'm going to share my screen here so all of our viewers can see my presentation. Okay, so before we start discussing this very important correlation, the correlation between periodontal disease and diabetes, I'd like to highlight that the concept of the mouth-body connection is not new. In fact, it's been in the medical field for a very long time. It actually dates back to the 1900s. In fact, in 1918, the director of the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company claimed that dental hygiene programs would be without question of great value to our country and that his data led him to conclude that preventing oral health disease could reduce problems and time away from work. Over several decades, correlations about the economic impact of oral health led to propaganda, a lot of propaganda and scientific publications such as this one. Here, um, a tooth is described as a menace to health. Poison from it may damage vital organs, causing eye, ear, nerve, joint, digestive troubles, and a series of other host um, immune responses. And um, they used to actually have this little booklet that they provided for patients so they can refer to when they wanted to ask um, or refer to when they had questions about maintaining optimum oral health. And here is another miraculous photograph published in the Dental Times of Interest, depicting the miraculous therapeutic effects of oral health treatment on a young boy with arthritis. As you can see here, um, his pre-dental treatment shows him decrepit, lying in bed with a solemn face. And at the top there are periapical radiographs. His post-dental treatment, however, portrays him transformed into a well-dressed, sitting upright, smiling young man. So the implications are clear. 
treatment of oral disease had a profoundly positive impact on his arthritis. And throughout the decades, a similar growing volume of publications led to worldwide interest. And most of these publications were published by physicians, one of which was Dr. Charles Mayo, at the time a highly medical dignitary who categorized dentists as physicians of the mouth. And since then, periodontal disease has been correlated with over 50 different types of systemic conditions, including obesity, cancer, chronic respiratory diseases, infertility, osteoporosis, stroke, rheumatoid arthritis, cardiovascular disease, and of course, diabetes. So let's start by the definition of periodontal disease. What is periodontal disease? Periodontal disease is characterized as a chronic inflammatory disorder. And in response to a bacterial challenge, our host uh, immune system elicits a cascade of immune, immune responses that lead to tissue loss. That also leads to alveolar bone loss, and if untreated, leads to tooth loss. Now this slide here demonstrates the prevalence of periodontal disease in the United States, which is remarkably high in individuals 30 years or older. And among that 42%, 60 to 70% of adults are 65 years and older and present with severe periodontal disease. So we can say that the elderly are more prone to have periodontal disease. But let's go back to that 42% here. That 42%, which includes the elderly, represents almost 144 million people in the US. And evidence suggests that it's at least this likely in the rest of the world. Uh, Dr. Zuli, we can't, I can't hear you. Still no audio. Dan and Eden, can you hear him? Hear her? No, I cannot. Nope. She just, uh, you might've hit mute perhaps or audio off the little blue microphone down at the bottom of, to the left. Yeah. Your microphone is turned okay. off. The, there we are. Welcome back. <laughs> no, no, no. Just the last, okay. just the last little bit. We heard you say the 143 million. You're, like, oh, you're okay. Just dropped. It. Just dropped. Interesting. Well, we gotta love technology. Let's 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 go back and it hop happens, into it. it. Happens right now. Yeah, okay. it's okay. It's okay. I got it. You guys can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. Sounds good. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. Okay. Perfect. Right. Just one second here. Can you see my screen? Uh, nope, just you. Okay. We will figure this out here. Hey, Dr. Miller, quick question for you. Yeah. So in, in dentistry, well, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll add, I'm going to save it. It's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I am waiting, waiting anticipatorily. It's, it's that good. Okay, Dr. Zuli, we got you. <laughs> Is that okay? We're on. Sounds we're good. on. Okay, let me go ahead and share this one more time here. Okay, I'm going to go through my slides. So I left off in the 144 million people in the U.S. Correct? Yep. Yep. All right. Sounds good. So now I'm going to go ahead and briefly describe the pathogenic mechanism linking periodontal disease and diabetes. And I want to highlight that the inflammation is really the central feature of the pathogenesis between diabetes and periodontitis. Diabetes increases the levels of glucose and advanced glycation end products. And as a result of this, we have a dysbiosis in the oral cavity. 
where um, as a result, our immune system elicits a host of inflammatory, uh, pro-inflammatory markers, such as interleukin-1, interleukin-6, interleukin-17, and tumor necrosis factor alpha, which then um, uh, impedes the, 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 the mechanism of PDL cells, osteoblasts and osteocytes, enhance, uh, and thus has an enhanced uh, bone loss. So when we lose our bone, we start losing our teeth. And essentially, this is what uh, occurs in periodontal disease and diabetes is a bidirectional uh, mechanism here that affects both systems. And there is very strong evidence for the association between periodontitis and glycemic status. And this is actually an excellent study. It's a systematic review and meta-analysis, which gathered evidence from six studies representing populations of the United States, Japan, and Taiwan, with a total sample size of almost 78,000 participants. And their conclusion um, led them to um, conclude that patients with periodontal disease exhibited a higher chance of developing diabetes. But how much so? Well, in the Hallmark study from Mealy, he actually confirmed that diabetes is unequivocally a major risk factor for periodontal disease. In fact, the risk of periodontitis is increased by threefold in individuals with diabetic with diabetes compared to patients without diabetes. And in Grossi's study, he found that diabetes mellitus was the only systemic disease associated with attachment loss, which is, which is tissue loss. And tissue loss, if untreated, then proceeds to uh, bone loss. Three times more bone loss, actually, in patients with periodontal disease. And he also found that patients who underwent periodontal treatment can have a reduction of up to 10% in their HbA1c levels. Now that we're talking about periodontal treatment and how it improves diabetic outcomes, I want to talk about this article. This is also uh, an incredible article, which is a systematic review with meta-analysis with four different um, studies that clinically proved and provided consistent evidence for clinically meaningful and statistical significant reduction in HbA1c levels. His study ranged the reduction ranged from 0.27 to 0.48 after following patients three to four months after periodontal therapy. But the most extraordinary finding was that the patients who underwent periodontal treatment had a reduction of HbA1c levels similar to that of adding another medication to their pharmacological regimen. So we can consider removing an additional medication to patient's protocol just by undergoing periodontal intervention, by lowering that bacterial load. And as we know, medications have side effects and interactions um, that are less than ideal for our patients. However, like I said, lowering that bacterial load does appear to have a profound positive impact on diabetic patients and the management of their uh, glycemic control. So now I'm going to go over oral manifestations of um, diabetic patients. And this is for oral colleagues, but most importantly for our medical colleagues, because I want, um, I would, I would like for our medical colleagues to be comfortable triaging patients and including the mouth as another organ system while they're triaging their patients in their diabetes consultation. So gingivitis is the initial, um, condition that can predispose patients to have periodontal disease. We have an initial inflammatory response with arithmetous tissues, and if untreated, can lead to periodontal disease. At this point, the condition is reversible. However, if untreated, then we can go ahead and develop periodontal disease, which is a lot harder to manage. We also have an increased in dental caries rate. And one of the reasons is because we have uh, uh, low salivary flow. 
We also have a poor healing response. And unfortunately, I do see this in the scope of my practice as I am a surgeon, especially under after undergoing surgical intervention. Patients do um, have a poor uh, healing response if they're uncontrolled. Patients, as we're going to talk about soon, patients that are, are controlled do respond fairly well. We can have multiple abscesses. We can have candida infection. Again, because of the symbiosis that occurs in the oral cavity, patients present with fungal infections and they're manifested in, in the oral cavity. We have a decreased salivary flow, which is very significant. That can also lead to uh, burning mouth syndrome, which could be very difficult to treat um, with our patients. So how do uh, diabetic patients respond to periodontal treatment? Well, the literature suggests that patients who are controlled, which present with an HbA1c level of less than eight, have similar responses to non-diabetic patients. As a result, um, we can keep treatment, we can keep patients in periodontal treatment, and that is in maintenance every three months. We can keep them nice and monitored. However, uncontrolled patients, which the literature suggests that is a nine or higher, they do tend to respond um, in a delayed healing fashion um, and increase infection uh, for, patient, for, for diabetic patients. So the International Diabetes Federation and the European Federation of Periodontology set out guidelines for our colleagues or medical colleagues, physicians, and other healthcare professionals to use in their diabetes practice. And the main um, concept that they uh, emphasize is oral health education. We wanna make sure that our physicians, Dr. Miller, and, and I, I, I know that she's more than comfortable, but um, I want to, I want, I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions and chime in here about your experience, but we want, for our medical colleagues to feel comfortable talking about the increased risk of periodontal disease in diabetic patients. We also want our patients to know that periodontitis does have a negative impact on the metabolic control of these diabetic patients. And as a result of that, can increase other comorbidities such as heart disease, kidney function, et cetera. And that successful uh, therapy, periodontal therapy, may have a positive impact on their metabolic control and diabetes complications. So we want to make sure that you're comfortable asking, investigate what are the his what is their history of periodontal disease. Look for these signs and symptoms. Do they have boggy arithmetic tissues? Do they have any abscesses? Look in the mouth. Include the mouth. Um, in your protocol when you're when you're asking patients about the other organ systems in your body. So periodontal examination should occur during their ongoing management of uh, diabetes. And we would like for you to encourage that um, throughout that process. And if patients have lost uh, uh, teeth, uh, have a, a multiple teeth missing, it's important for our physicians also to encourage them to go to their general dentist so we can rehabilitate and restore adequate mastication. And of course, that leads to better nutrition for our patients. And the most important uh, topic of all, or the most, the, what I want to highlight the most is that I would like for physicians to communicate with their dentist over their diabetes management. Coming uh, from a daughter of a physician, my father always, and he, and he studied med medicine twice, once in our country in Cuba and here in the United States as well. And he recalls maybe one or two classes about the oral cavity uh, while he was studying. And, um, it's, it's really important that uh, physicians feel comfortable asking, picking up the phone, asking uh, the dentist what type of interventions these patients are going uh, under because our scope of practice is very broad. Um, we also have specialties such as uh, periodontists who make sure and who specialize in the disease of the gums and bone, but we transfer uh, bone, we transfer tissue from cadavers, we uh, restore function with implants, etc. So there's a wide scope of practice and we want physicians to feel comfortable asking about how um, how uh, complex these treatments uh, may be. So Dr. Miller, what is your experience um, with talking to our colleagues, our oral healthcare colleagues? What has that been like? 
Uh, I'll tell you, it, it's really an emerging uh, area of collaboration. I mean, I can tell you personal stories of uh, even when I uh, obtained dental services as a person with type 1 diabetes, and, and uh, unfortunately, um, I fall into that category of that increased risk. And so it's been on many levels. It's been both a personal uh, as well as a professional. Uh, in addition, you know, just as you were speaking, and, and this is a relatively new experience for me to be invited to uh, team dental, team oral health. And, and so one of the excitement with it is, you know, I work pretty extensively with the ADA and I'm the, the chairperson, the, the committee chair for uh, therapeutic inertia, which is trying to move the needle on care. And one of the things we've defined is what we call team diabetes. And so with that, you know, I, I guess maybe I should say that all of you have been formally invited to team diabetes as of today. Uh, and we're really trying to move that needle. And, and one of these things that we're doing has been is really an introduction. And so I think we are going to be really going from here. Uh, and so I would say that I have had that interaction or interfacing uh, on a very, um, you know, introductory level, but I'm really looking forward to what I would term collaboration. And what I mean by that is just a really a, a, a working or symbiotic relationship between um, the uh, doctors of the mouth, because if we leave it unchecked, we, it's our weakest link and how, you know, we, we have to cut, we have to treat the whole person. Absolutely. You know, hey, let me jump in for a second. So I, I'm talking right now to all the folks uh, listening. So for those of you participating live, what we'd love to have you be thinking about now and feel free to go in the chat. I see a number of you are. So thank you. Uh, but after um, uh, Dr. Miller talks a little bit deeper in, into diabetes, then we're going to be engaging in a conversation that Dr. Zuli and Miller just teed up beautifully which is how can we work together? That's really what this is all about. Because at the end of the day, the patient sitting in front of us, whether they're in an MD's office, a diabetologist, uh, or you know, a dentist or hygienist, it's the same patient. And how do we work together? So we're looking for you folks to help us think through. We don't have all the answers. What are the hurdles to us working together and how do we overcome them ultimately for better health outcomes? So just a teaser for you guys would like this to be interactive uh, and let's all learn from each other. So uh, Dr. Zuli, anything more before we kick over to Dr. Miller? Yep, Dr. I'm gonna go ahead and, and describe now the guidelines for our, our oral health care colleagues. Excellent. And then we can go ahead and, and take um, Take it over, Dr. Miller, for sure. So we're gonna, uh, these are guidelines for our oral healthcare professionals to use in the dental practice because we want to make sure that we educate them as well and create this bi-directional relationship with our physician. So we want to encourage a thorough oral examination for our diabetic patients, which includes full mouth probing and bleeding scores. We also want to educate our, um, uh, our patients about optimum oral health and tailor it to their specific regimen. Like I mentioned before, these patients tend to present with serostomia um, and a whole host of other conditions. So we want to make sure that we treat them accordingly. And if periodontal uh, treatment is not rendered at the moment or they're not diagnosed with periodontal disease per se, we want to make sure that we uh, educate them about the risk involved in the progression of the disease to periodontitis and that we need to monitor them closely. We also want to um, get a careful history to highlight what type of diabetes they have, the duration of the disease, how long were they diagnosed with periodontal disease? Do they have any other comorbidities? Have they had any complications, neuropathy, retino uh, retinopathies? So we want to make sure that we kind of calibrate, um, you know, where they stand today and their history as well. And do they have any, uh, any concomitant therapies? Like I said, patients have other uh, comorbidities. Are they on any blood thinners if they have any uh, uh, cardiac conditions? And we want to ask, ask them about their HbA1c levels, ask them about their glycemic control. Sometimes I ask patients, what is your HbA1c level? And they look at me and they're like, what are you talking about, doctor? They have no idea. 
So we can gauge a lot about the communication with our patients, ask them for a copy of their uh, CBC, their uh, CMPs, um, and their HbA1c, and just pick up the phone and call your diabetologist and your endocrinologist so we can make sure that we provide the patient with the most integrative and optimum care that we can. And uh, for as far as surgical intervention, we would like to have ideally, if it's not an emergency type of care, um, that our patients have non-surgical therapy prior to undergoing surgery. And what I mean by non-surgical therapy is for them to be in maintenance at least for the uh, at least a month, so we can lower that bacterial load and reduce the the uh, possibility of infection. We also want to know what their insulin, if they're on insulin, what their management is, because you don't want to run into a medical emergency. Like I said, consult with your physician. Make sure you pick up the phone and remember that patients that are well controlled do very well in um, a dental setting and respond very well to surgical interventions as well, in fact, as patients without diabetes. So that concludes my presentation and I can't wait to hear um, Dr. Miller. These are my references and my contact information sh uh, should you need to contact me with any questions or concerns. That's great. Dr. Zuli, thank you. There's a lot in there that we are gonna do deep dives in. The chat room is on fire, so thank you. So I keep calling you Dr. Miller and Dr. Eden. I'm flipping back and forth, you know, so everybody, it's the same person. It, she's it she's all that. She needs two names. It's like she's the opposite of Prince. She needs two names. One is not enough. So Dr. Eden Miller, could you uh, really thank you again for a, a vastly uh, dental audience to help us with uh, a little bit deeper understanding of really what is diabetes? Yeah, and really thank you. Uh, the honor is all mine to be invited to your group. Um, you'll you'll be able to feel by the time I'm done discussing one of my favorite subjects to talk about. And part of the reason why I enjoy it is because I really love to educate my colleagues and you are one of my colleagues and I want you to feel empowered because uh, we're going forward in this uh, chronic disease and we're really developing the components. It really hasn't been that long that we have taken this disease from a very, you know, 30,000 foot view into a very specific view. And I wanted to define diabetes because I think there is a bit of a misnomer with it. Oftentimes providers that I encounter, they say diabetes is a sugar problem. It's like, well, yes. And I often say that glucose is really the mascot of diabetes. I'm not minimizing it, uh, but rather it's a it, it's an indicator that there is a dysfunction on a, on a total metabolic level. So when we look at the definition, this is actually one of the definitions that I've provided. And it's this impairment of the body's ability to effectively transport glucose into the cell so it can be utilized for fuel. But it really is a dual hormone disease because insulin has a counter-regulatory hormone and that hormone is glucagon. And it's that on and off of our body and it's that balance. And so one of the issues is, is that persons with diabetes have a dysfunction in this. And, and many of us think it's all in insulin dysfunction. It's not quite. I often use the analogy that diabetes is starvation in the land of plenty. And you might say, what do you mean by starvation in the land of plenty? Well, on the cellular level, the cell is starving. But on the, the serum level or on, in the vascular system, there is a you know, cornucopia of glucose, but it's not able to be placed into the cell to be burned because there's even an issue with either the amount of insulin, if you're insulinopenic or insulin deficient, like type one, or if you're insulin resistant, where you can't open or unlock the door for the glucose to go in. And so the analogy I use is that your cell is so hungry. And so it picks up the phone and it calls Domino's Pizza and it says, will you please deliver a pizza? And they come and they deliver it to the front door the cell, they ring the doorbell, but nobody comes because the key is insulin to unlock that door. And so the cell calls Domino's Pizza again through the message of glucagon because the body 
on the cellular level is starving. And so this thing occurs over and over and over again of imbalance of excessive glucagon because the body's signaling for glucose and the pizzas are building up on the front porch and nobody's bringing them into the cell, nobody's burning them. And so it really becomes more of a dysmetabolic issue uh, with uh, glucose being, like I said, the mascot, imagine, if we use the analogy of the flu, you come in with the flu and you have a fever and we say, you have the flu, you have a fever, we have tested you. I'm going to give you Tylenol to help your fever. Your fever is gone, your flu is cured. No. And that's what we're learning about diabetes, that you can even lower glucose, even though I think on the periodontal and oral level, Glycemic control may be more tied to that because we're finding that there's sugar that builds in the mouth, not just saliva. I was amazed as we took an opportunity to look at glycemia, it shifts in the mouth. And imagine all those bacteria there, like it's a buffet, yay! And they're just multiplying and doing all their things. And so a good definition of diabetes and how to intervene because it really is a dysmetabolic state. And this ominous octet is Ralph DeFranza, we call him the godfather of diabetes. And I've actually expanded these causes of diabetes because we realize it's a three-dimensional disease. And as I mentioned earlier, I would remove hyperglycemia. I would put dysmetabolism because it's really an inflammatory dysregulated system that impacts the fat and the energy. Uh, persons with diabetes, 50% of the glycemic burden or load is made glucose. It's why those persons will come in and they'll say, you know, my sugar's high, but I'm eating salad. And they say, why is that? And I say, because you make glucose. Your brain is an obligate glucose burner. It requires glucose. It's why the keto diet is hard to stay on. You get foggy because your brain requires glucose. Now, fortunately, your brain doesn't require insulin to transport glucose. Can you imagine the first hypoglycemic episode? We'd all be dead because the brain would not get that glucose level. And so we are unpacking the fact that this disease is a three-dimensional organ system. It involves many dysfunctional things. It's not just an insulin problem. If it was, we would just have, you know, a tanker truck of insulin follow a person with diabetes. I use the analogy of a Hummer body and a Honda engine. And, and we, we, we don't fix the problem of a Hummer being low in gas by adding more gas. We have a gas mileage issue. And so we've increased the look at what we call the total causes for diabetes. And you can see my name was included in this list, my colleagues, uh, Stan Schwartz, Richard Aguilar, and we called it the Egregious 11. I know it's a dramatic title. I really wasn't involved in that, but we had to go from Ralph DeFranzo's ominous octet to the Egregious 11. And we added three coffee cans and those coffee cans of diagnosis were gut microbiota. And I would include, even though many of you, because I, I'm only been invited to the party, this is the gateway to the gut. This is part of it. This is the door to the gut. And what comes through here determines there. What remains here determines there. And I've been doing research in the microflora of the alimentary system and its effect on glucose management. We've done uh, trials looking at uh, alterations of this. And now that I've been invited to the oral party and the oral club, I really want my, my uh, honorary dental degree just so I feel like you guys. Uh, we really need to unpack how this affects that. We also added inflammatory markers. All of you have personally firsthand realized this. COVID-19 is an inflammatory condition. It's disproportionately causing morbidity and mortality in persons with type 2 diabetes. There's a reason for that. They are an inflammatory group. And then finally, uh, 
epigenetics. If none of you have looked up epigenetics, what a fascinating concept that actually through our diet, through the diet of the father that sires an offspring, you can increase the chance of developing diabetes by upregulating uh, nuclear DNA transcription of insulin by dietary intake, and you pass on to your offspring the increased risk of diabetes by individually activating your own epigenome. So now you must think, oh man, we're all doomed. We're doomed to develop this disease. But the reality is, is when I talk about developing diabetes, there are 33 million people in the United States with diabetes. There are 79 million people with prediabetes and greater than three quarters of them do not even know they have it. It is an epidemic. It is a pandemic. It will be with us for a long time, most likely because we are not consulting the user manual of the body. It is not just a weight driven thing as my degree in obesity management uh, really uh, that I added to this. It, it highlights that we have an epidemic of, of obesity as a disease. And so we don't want to be disproportionately blaming them. They have a disease that spills over. And so let's talk a bit about Target, because this is a, a, a bit of a controversy in my field. And I will pull you into that controversy without any hesitation. Uh, diabetes is the only chronic disease in the world that has three separate international metrics for control. We have the American Diabetes Association of less than seven. We have the American Academy of Clinical Endocrinology, which is less than 6.5. And then we have the American uh, Association of Medicine uh, that's less than eight. Uh, and so oftentimes in different arenas that I'm at, uh, we have this discussion because it does bring up the fact that diabetes is the only disease state where normal is not the target. And I think it's because for years we didn't know how to treat it without minimizing the risk of hypoglycemia. So some of my colleagues have been misinformed that a low or controlled A1C is actually risky. It's hypoglycemia that's risky. It's not the destination, it's how you get there. And because we have better tools and better ways to monitor through CGM, we now know that probably the goal should be remission. And I liken it to cancer because it is a chronic disease and it isn't something you take an antibiotic with and you're done. And so even though it's not really held hard in the literature, if you have an individual less than 40 and they're developing diabetes because it's also the leading pediatric chronic disease. And so we are going to have this, they estimate, that by 2030, one in three individuals in the US will have type two diabetes. And so this will come up over and over and over again as we're screening. And we must impact it because too many of our persons with diabetes are going on to what I call diabetes hospice, right? They've lost their kidneys, they've lost their eyes, they've lost their function. And then we look at them and say, well, we really don't want to control them that tight because it's almost like it doesn't matter, right? You know, when a hospice patient is there, we, we tend to back off a bit with their control. But maybe normalizing these individuals early on in their disease, never letting them graduate, never letting them progress, keeping them in remission is what the target should be. And so many of us are having meetings about this. And so if you have a young individual less than 40, we say, you should be under six. You should be normal. Now, not at the expense of hypoglycemia. It's an independent risk factor. It negates that benefit. And so you can see that that consensus is challenging because there are healthcare providers that are following different panels. And they might say to one of your clients, oh, yes, my A1C is controlled. It's eight. And you're sitting there going, well, I saw Dr. Miller and eight is kind of like, that's high, right? It is. It still progresses. It's above even the diagnostic criteria. So for your takeaway, let me leave you with this. The diagnostic criteria for type 2 diabetes is an A1C of 6.5 or greater. If you keep that in your mind and you target that, as long as there's no hypoglycemia, you will be well within the standards. 
and the continuity. And you can see we have these little percentages down below. I actually have a thermometer that I can share with Dan and we can put it later. It's a thermometer of green to red in each corresponding A1C and what average glycemia that is. And it's a way to reference. You can just look at it and say, here's where you're at. You're in the red zone. You're in the yellow zone. Because what I've learned today is that when I'm out of control, I'm feeding the danger in my mouth and I'm creating this portal for complications that don't just reach the mouth. They're the entry point for the body. And I'm so glad uh, to start incorporating you into the team. And I have to share just a story real quick. I was working with the National Community Healthcare Workers two days ago. I was doing a broadcast to all of the migrant and farm workers of the United States. And there were thousands of, of individuals on. And my colleague who was also with me on the ADA talked about team diabetes and she listed off them and she mentioned you. And I was like, yay, they're on the team. And we're starting to have these conversations. So we wanted you to be ready uh, to be on our team. And so I'm gonna speed up a little bit. So as I talk about A1C, I want you to understand that it's an average. And when you have an average, it's a metric that's starting to go a little bit out of favor. Uh, the reason is, is because if you were speeding in your town and your police officer pulled you over and said, oh, you have been, you're going 30 in a 20. And you said, but my average speed is 20. He says, I don't care because you're actually speeding. And so an A1C is an average, but you can see here, here are continuous glucose monitoring tracing of persons with the same A1C because it's an average. And you can see that the individual who is in that kind of teal color, they have the same A1C, but they have less glucose variability. So CGM is becoming that real-time monitoring of glycemia, and it's going to be the wave of the future. All of you are seeing those little Libre things on the back. Your patients are going to be coming in with it. It really is a speedometer that empowers the patient and the provider to keep pace with their disease. And I pulled this slide from a foundation that I was working on, and I was really excited, and I had to put it in because it talked about the brain and the nerves and all those things that we knew were a part of diabetes. And, and the group is getting bigger, by the way. I have a global board, a uh, cardio renal metabolic diabetes board. And I saw this and the tooth is there. And so I pulled it up because really you guys are being invited to the table to have this conversation. So we all have the shared message. We all reinforce the person with diabetes, that we are all involved, that all the organ systems are involved and we all want to work together and encouraging that patient, sharing the standards of care. And you know, the other thing, sharing the burden. I can't do it all. I can't do it all. I don't want to do it all, but I want to know that someone else is going to be there. I had a cardiologist call me this morning. Dr. Miller, will you call me back? I, I heard you're, you're doing some diabetes stuff and, and, and I want to work with you in terms of the heart. I mean, what a great opportunity for us all to kind of come into that thing together. So here's the team members. This is how we share the burden. This is how we share the patient. This is how we want to have that collaboration. And I hope this is our first kind of foundational start for that and that we can equip you and empower you and encourage you because I can't reach everybody, but by reaching you and you taking the next step and reaching your colleagues and the provider who's next door to you. I have a dentist right there uh, and we're gonna go over there and I'm gonna actually establish and say, hey, we're working in the field of diabetes. I would love to discuss that with you. And that's what it's gonna take. Maybe being a little brave, reaching out to colleagues, you know, dropping your card off saying, hey, I wanna help you with this. So welcome to the team and I'll stop with that. Awesome. By the way, um, Dr. Zuli and Dr. Eden, the comments, and I'm getting texts are, are off the charts. Uh, people really appreciate your explanations. So before we uh, jump into sort of how will, how will this come together, this team diabetes? How do we bring oral health into systemic health for, for diabetics? Uh, quick, real quick questions for you, Dr. Dr. Miller. In, in a couple sentences, a, uh, type one versus type two. 
Oh yeah, um, there are probably five types of diabetes, which is not what you asked me. We're in the process of defining them. Uh, yeah. Type one and type two are about as far as apart as they can be. Uh, and that is important for you to know. Uh, that person with type one diabetes tends to be an autoimmune condition. Uh, there are some variations with that, but we won't go into it. It's an autoimmune destruction of the pancreas that can happen at any age. Um, I, The oldest I've had who has uh, had a new onset type one was 65, uh, so don't miss them. Uh, if you look at somebody and they just don't fit the bill and and even if they're coming to you saying, you know, my diabetes hasn't been controlled and I've been on pills, but I don't understand. You know, if there's this little voice in you that says that they don't fit the bill, they're lean, uh, they're not well controlled, they're not having issues, just kind of mention it. So you might want to follow up with your provider and make sure that you're on the right program. We generally see the peak in the teens and, and grade school age and then again in the 20s and then some random ones, what are called LADAs, latent autoimmune diabetes of the adult. Uh, beyond uh, the 20s. And it really is a insulin deficiency state. They do not make insulin and it is required for them to live and to survive. Awesome, thank you. That was great. Um, so let's, uh, let's pivot a little bit for the dentists, hygienists and the, and the, the dental teams uh, that are listening right now. Uh, what role they can have on team diabetes. And I'd like to start, if that's all right with y'all, with sort of as the patient arrives, like what's the type of information that they can start gathering so that A, they can know that the patient, that the person they're dealing with is a diabetic because let's, as we've said, some of them may not know it uh, yet. So um, what role for dentists? Uh, any, any thoughts there? Um, Absolutely. So gathering a thorough medical history is of optimum importance. We want to make sure um, that we uh, get uh, the duration of um, how long they ha they've been experiencing period of uh, uh, diabetes. And if they feel any pain or discomfort relating to periodontal disease, or they have any bleeding gum, um, and then treat them accordingly, provide a, pr a comprehensive periodontal evaluation so we can assess them and um, ask for their HbA1c level. What is their glycemic control? Do they even know what an HbA1c is? A lot of patients are not even aware of, of their HbA1c levels. Do they take their um, blood glucose in the morning? Are they on insulin? There's a whole host of questions that we can kind of gather so we can ask patients and kind of triage them and see if they um, if, if and what type of diabetes they have. Because sometimes, unfortunately, they don't. They don't even realize that they do. And there's um, diagnostic aids that are also available to us or will be available to us in the form of salivary uh, DNA and, and salivary glucose that we can also incorporate into our practice to facilitate that for our patients. I think it's great for me to hear what she's doing as a routine basis in her practice, because I mean, I'm not always aware of some of those screening things that you're doing. And I think that's great in terms of the understanding. I want to take it just from the mouth physician to the to the uh, medical physician, because I would love to say that all my colleagues have a vast, deep understanding of the disease state that they treat. They don't. That's where I'm working in that. And so I'm going to take what Dr. Zuli said and, and add one more thing. Uh, some persons have been told by their providers that they have a touch of sugar. And that has such a large definition. I've seen everybody indicating that they have a touch of sugar and their A1C is eight, uh, that they have not really been told that they have fulminant diabetes. When an individual goes from, let's say, the pre-diabetes state, which is really an A1C defined as 5.7 to less than 6.5, uh, even though you would agree that 6.4 is very close, right? And so it's kind of like, I'm not touching you, but you're really close, right? And so I grade the risk differently based in the pre-diabetes category. But I don't like to use the word pre-diabetes because it's like being pre-pregnant. And I've used that and it make, gets a lot of chuckles, but it really is a great analogy. You cannot be pre-pregnant. You cannot be pre-diabetic. You're early diabetic. And by the time you graduate, so when a person comes in for the first time and they've crossed the threshold, diagnostically an A1C of 6.5 above, two glucoses in the morning greater than 127, does anybody know how much of their insulin beta cell function is already gone? It's 70%. There is nothing pre and there is nothing early about that. And so what our job is to do is to identify those at risk, 
intervene and get control to place the disease in remission on not allowing it to graduate. So as you know, as you encounter your colleagues, you're going to say, Dr. Miller, we're not doing a very good job. Yeah. And that's why the advent of the Therapeutic Inertia Board for the American Diabetes Association. I also would direct your clients to the ADA website. There are thousands of tools in multiple languages, diabetes risk assessment tools, how to find a local place to screen for diabetes. Uh, you know, what is an A1C? Things to bring your provider. It's a way to empower the patient, empower the provider, complete the loop because it's all about the patient. Even if you interact with colleagues who maybe are missing the mark a bit. You know, Dr. Miller, I, when I heard you say go to the ADA website for all of our, for, for everybody out there, this is the first time on a Crest Oral B webinar, the ADA is not the American Dental Association, it's the American <laughs> Diabetes Association. So Wait, but we should have been married all along, I'm right? Ready, I'm there, but this is matchmaking happening right here. By the way, this we're going to do a whole thing. We're breaking a glass. It's going to be fantastic. Everyone stay on afterwards after the Q&A. That's your teaser. Don't drop. So uh, one thing that Dr. Miller just mentioned is um, a risk assessment. So I'm going to go a little old school. I'm just going to show you one because people might have heard Dr. Zuli say, hey, let's take a more comprehensive uh, patient history. Let's really understand what's happening in the body, which can influence the mouth. Or what's, then you'll see what's happening in the mouth. You'll realize, oh my gosh, it's influencing the body. So I'm literally going to hold it up to the camera. So this is a pre-diabetes risk test. And um, I don't know if it's like, it shows backwards on my own screen, but am I no, looking in my own mirror? I don't know. It's, 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 Oh, it's good? Okay. Yes. All right, I'm having like a whole moment here. All right, so, um, and what that is, it's a National Diabetes Prevention Program. It's, this is, it's the uh, ADA's put out, one. Exactly. Yeah. It's put out by the CDC and the American Diabetes Association. So what you can do, and you can go to the American Diabetes Association website. You can find this. Obviously, we can get it out to anybody who wants, or we can post it. Um, but it's ubiquitous. I found it. You can find it because I'm not so good. Um, but it's these type of basic questions. And there's not a ton of them, right? It's just a basic seven questions. At the end of it's a score. And I'm not saying that 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 a, 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 a someone on the dental team will is then going to say to someone, "You're a diabetic." But what they can say is, based on this score, I think first we're going to do not that you wouldn't do a deep dive into the mouth anyway, but hey, we're going to maybe frame things in a certain way, and I'm going to encourage you to speak. To, you know, to talk to on the medical side here. Mm -hmm. In fact, I don't know if, if, if the practice you're in likes paper, I don't know, but you can even send them home with it, you know, or, or what it would be and say, hey, we can help here. And Sue, as, a, as, as hygienists, as dentists and, and other uh, oral health professionals, knowing that context and helping your patient know that their risk factors are, are so much more elevated it would be an incredible service uh, that you could. It also makes me think, uh, imagine if we were coming to you telling you that in the next few years, a third of your patients are going to have the same medical condition that affects oral health. You would all be like, oh, I need to know what that is. I, I need to figure it out. Well, you now know it, it's diabetes. And I think it's been a long time coming in bringing you to the table um, I've even learned myself, uh, you know, I'm an expert in diabetes and the time I've spent with the dental group of discovering that controlling the mouth and its inflammation improves glycemia on the order of a medication. Share that with your colleagues. That That's a very powerful thing because patients feel whoever gets to heaven with the least meds wins. Like that's their goal. You know, I got there with one med, you know, yeah. and, and, and if there's any things that we can do to restore, because yes, I'm the expert at how to implement tools and that kind of thing. And really what's the Holy grail. Don't ever get diabetes, right? That's the Holy grail. Right. But once you're there, you know, how we manage it and how we keep pace with it, it's a lifelong condition. This is going to be a part of their story in their mouth care for the rest of their life. And, and, and Dr. Miller, same thing for periodontal disease. Once you're diagnosed as a periodontally compromised patient, you've, you have already lost tissue and you've already lost bone. And as a result, given this other comorbidity, such as diabetes, you're, you're married for life. So we want to make sure that we control these patients. And we talked about open communication and referring patients to the dentist, but it's also bi-directional, like 
Dan was mentioning, we want to make sure that once we um, have this risk assessment for our patient, that we encourage our patient to go ahead and go back to their physician and evaluate and see what's going on with their metabolic uh, state so we can um, treat them and provide them the best oral health care and um, general health care possible so we can maintain them um, at a good at a good um, at a good service so we can treat them accordingly. Excellent. I, think it's great. I mean, it's very well said. You, just like your periodontal disease is really, is really kind of the hospice of the mouth. You're just trying to maintain it for the rest of their life. Um, we all talk about prevention, and I think we're getting there. But because diabetes has been allowed to be quite rampant and unchecked for several years, uh, it's the most uh, money occupying disease in the United States. Uh, that we're going to have to move the needle. And so there are going to be those that we just cannot drift them into to uh, over control. And so having those messages, I often use the analogy to my young kids who are developing diabetes in their 20s and 30s. I say your 50 year old self is asking you to take this seriously, to deal with it early, to start that preventative treatment. Uh, and then we do have to address those of their artery in the complications with it. Uh, and so I, I foresee that that even my role as a person, as I told you, I'm going to go next door to our local dentist here uh, to introduce myself to say, hey, you know, let me know if you have anything and let me know if I have any of your direction it, it, on our risk in our assessment. When we look, we have a lot as providers. Um, and so uh, we have, you know, do you have an eye appointment? Have you had your feet checked? Have you had your labs? And I now have the new thing on my intake have you been to your dentist? And having that conversation with them is how we start. So what's the adage, a job begun is half done. Uh, and so we're going to begin that today. And each of you are gonna have your own journey of exploration. I would encourage you not to be intimidated by my medical brethren. They're a little bit autonomous. They're a little bit goofy sometimes. You know, if you come to them saying, hey, I wanna help your patient manage their disease, uh, you know, let me know what's best uh, to assist in that with the patient and hopefully they'll, they'll respond to you uh, in a positive manner. If you want to leave referral forms or something so we can just check and hand it out and say, this is for this. Uh, that's always a, a great time saver for us. Fantastic. So a uh, question to the greater audience. Um, dentists and dental practices can perform A1C blood tests. Now, of course, they have to have the equipment and there's a CLIO uh, certificate and all the rest, but if- It's clear uh, wave. Yeah, uh, it's, clear yeah wave. it's clear wave. Yeah, it's clear. Yeah, Thank it's you. Clear of course, wave. it's so well accepted and it's ubiquitous. Yeah. Um, it, it, one can certainly apply for a clear waiver and, and away you go. So I'd love to see in the comments if anyone works in the dental practice where this is actually happening. And uh, and then one thing I did want to share with folks to pick up on something Dr. Zuli had said about salivary diagnostics. Uh, the saliva in the blood, right? We, we're very used to in our in, in, in certainly in American healthcare system having our blood analyzed. What will be coming soon is saliva being diagnosed. There's, you know, I forget what the number is. It's somewhere north of 2,000 uh, biomarkers in blood. Well, there's a similar count in saliva, and there's a great deal of overlap. And you don't need to be injected. I mean, we've all, uh, and you're going to see an explosion in salivary diagnostics. We didn't need COVID and everyone having our saliva, you know, uh, uh, tested for it to explode, but there's an impetus there. So I just wanted to share with you all a study that came out during COVID and uh, it came out, I believe a group of um, physicians and dentists out of uh, Helsinki and Sweden, if memory serves. And the lead uh, uh, clinician is Dr. Andreas Gregor, it's uh, Grigori Ida, Grigoriadis and uh, out of uh, Greece. And if memory serves, I always remember it, Aristotle University. I always read that and said, I wouldn't have gone to there. That just sounds brilliant. But they did a study just came out in 2020 where they proposed that um, an efficient chair side clinical strategy for the identif identification of diabetics um, is a dental practice. And it's but it, even those which don't have uh, the capability or capacity to do H1, uh, eight, uh, A1C. So what they did is they actually, uh, what they came out is with four factors, uh, they, they concluded that dental dentists can, I'm not saying they said they would diagnose diabetes. What they called it is a quote, viable, viable screening strat strategy for referring dental patients for testing for diabetes. And they looked at periodontitis, 
something we've obviously touched on here, their age, their body mass, uh, their BMI, and an a, uh, a biomarker called, it's an MMP, which is, um, I love to say this out loud, a tissue destructive matrix metalloproteinases. Mm -hmm. And an mm -hmm. AMMP8, yes, we know the AMP8. Mm -hmm. By the way, if anyone in the US is like saying, I really have never heard of that, I, we're not surprised. It's somewhat ubiquitous now in Europe and don't tell our European friends this, but sometimes they're actually ahead of us and they're, they're ahead of us in celebrating right. diagnostics. They just are uh, on this one. They're diabetes too. <laughs> yeah, so you know, dental practices, this is just kind of a vision statement and I might be wrong, but I'm not wrong. Uh, it, it will not be too long. I don't think it'll be, it may not be next month, but when going to the dentist will seem somewhat like going to the doctor and it won't be, you already, take their blood pressure, it won't be crazy to either draw blood or at least take saliva and have the saliva, and I mean share side, I don't mean send it away, I mean in share side, and start telling people, here's what's happening in the mouth. And the best explanation I heard about it is from the uh, uh, CEO and chief uh, clinical officer at the Foresight Institute, did a webinar on this, he's an MD. Uh, and, the, and the Foresight Institute, if you haven't heard of it, they're affiliated with 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 Harvard, have been around for, I don't know, quite literally 100 years, a remarkably a uh, smart group. Uh, and he said, uh, dentistry right now, when it comes to diagnosing uh, maladies of the mouth, is uh, he, he made it akin to cardiovascular. He said, imagine if in the cardiovascular world, uh, they didn't test for cholesterol. And then they didn't try to start dealing with that issue early on. And instead, they waited till you had a heart attack. It's woof, there we go. Now oh, let's treat. Yeah. <laughs> right. And he, that was his analogy. And the whole point of this webinar that they did last week was to implore it was it was directed at oral health community was to implore the oral health community to please start paying attention to celebrate diagnostics. So anyway, not too much we can comment on now because we're a little bit ahead of the curve, but um, uh, just something very interesting. And I already see someone who's saying they they do blood glucose level testing in their dental practice. So that's wow. really, really there cool. You go. Yeah. All right. Awesome. So, so let's chat a little bit about it. So communication, you know, we're, you're both touched on it. So how do we, you know, is it right now, I think it falls upon the, the, the patient, right? They're the only common denominator, except in those few dental practices now that have a, a shared electronic health record, you know, same practice management system, medical and dental. And I, the, the only one I know of that is out there right now is, is Epic. And there's, uh, not that many yet, it's coming. So it, for most dental practices, the patient's data set just sits in their dental practice. And then the rest of their healthcare data sits in different places. So uh, suggestion, I think we've touched on a little bit, if you don't mind me touching back there, you know, for both Dr. Eden and Zuli, is what can we do? How do we help either the patient or how do we just better connect? Is it, do we have to make a hundred phone calls every week with our hundred patients? Like, is there a, is there something we can do between now and then? So I had the privilege of um, training at the Mayo Clinic where we actually used Epic, uh, Dan, now that you mentioned that. And it is a wonderful source because we were able to look at our patients' HPA1C uh, levels, our um, uh, plasma glucose, et cetera, all of the, the uh, medical information that we needed to treat our patients um, were available to us. And once I graduated, I saw that in our private practices, we don't have that uh, information readily available to us. So unfortunately, and fortunately, I see it as an opportunity. Um, we just have to pick up the phone and um, consult with our, our our providers, our medical providers to see um, what the, the status is of our patients. If our patients are not sure and they're not able to tell us, um, especially if they're undergoing a surgical intervention, we want to make sure that we um, promote integrative medicine um, like I said, at the Mayo Clinic, I had such a wonderful opportunity to work with cardiologists, to work with um, neurologists, to work with such a vast um, uh, array of, of physicians that they were only a phone call away or a message away through Epic. But in the real world, we want to make sure that we, we do whatever it takes to provide patients with the best care possible. And one of my mentors always said, don't treat a stranger. And if we don't want to treat a stranger, we need to make sure that we contact our colleagues, our medical colleagues. And if that 
means making a phone call. Unfortunately, our time is limited, but it is our responsibility to, to, to make that liaison and um, advocate for our patients. That's so great. Now, if I could add to that, um, because I know I don't want to burden you guys with time and that kind of thing. And so one of the things I think would be good is that if you gave a patient a sheet uh, when they left to provide to their provider to discuss, it appears that you're having diabetes related uh, risk factors or diabetes related complications that are expressing them in the mouth, please discuss this with your provider. You could have it on your letterhead. You could have if you have any calls or questions. Uh, in addition, you could send us what you call what would be a, a summary of your oral report, just like ophthalmology sends us that. I would really encourage you don't put all this stuff like O U O S plus minus 20, all those things. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> But <laughs> I don't know what that means. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I did a comprehensive oral evaluation on your patient. It appears mm -hmm. that they're having this kind of things. Uh, you know, I've given them instructions to follow up with you and then mm -hmm. pick up the phone just for the introductions. Hi, yeah. you know, maybe have lunch, you know, maybe the, the introductions. And so your name is not a stranger to me. And then only in emergent conditions. The only time I get called from a dentist is blood pressure. <laughs> We had your patient come in, their blood pressure is 200 oh. over 110. <laughs> and yeah. you're like, they're going to explode. <laughs> you yeah. know? So, you know, Dr. Miller, what you're referring to is a medical consult or a medical clearance, um, that a sheet or a letter that we sent to uh, our, our, our colleagues so we can um, see what the medical status is because we don't have EPIC and because we don't have these um these uh, labs that are at disposal. But yes, um, I, I'm glad that you mentioned that because when we do send out these letters, we tend to send our probing depths and sometimes you're like, what What do you mean? You know, So a, a, just a general summary of the type of intervention that our patients are actually going uh, to undergo is really, really important because like I said, the scope of our practice is so broad that we want to make sure that you're aware of if, if we're having like a surgical intervention, which is do every, which is what I do every day of my life. Um, so yes, we want to be a detail oriented, but not um, put, uh, you know, in the letter information that, you know, you may not know of. Hey, so let me, let me guys put you guys both on the spot. I'm going to ask you both to do like a 30 second answer. Right. So, and by the way, they are not prepped for this. This is, I like to surprise people. So I think a lot of the folks watching, it could be medical side, but certainly mainly dental side are saying, how would I say this to a patient in a way that's fairly understandable? So I have a diabetic that's sitting in front of me. So uh, either one can go first, but you know, how do you encourage them to make the link? You know, what, yeah. is there something you'd recommend them saying? Could you model that for us? Yeah, I was actually thinking about this on the way over because I love analogies, you know, and I yeah. sometimes use analogies of cars. Imagine if you had all, you know, car was great, but one of your holes had a, one of your tires had a nail in it. Would you be okay with that? Would you be running? And then I thought, you know, let's use an analogy of other of another body system that we prioritize. If a person with diabetes comes in with a ulcer on their foot, we immediately send them to wound care. We do not hesitate. We do not make suggestions of, you know, you should do better with your foot care. That's not what it is. It is a it is a directional intervention. If a person comes in unaddressing the mouth, unaddressing that, it's an intervention that's directional and deliberate. We do not want inertia or or barriers to inhibit, and we need to reframe that in our head. Excellent. Absolutely. And what I, I often tell my patients is that we don't want any infection anywhere in our bodies, right? But especially not in our mouth, because the mouth is a portal of entry of our foods. It's the entrance of our alimentary canal. If any of that infection enters our blood uh, uh, stream, then it can affect our other organ systems. So not only do we need to make sure that we have symbiosis in our oral cavity, but we also need to make sure that we understand that the mouth is the gateway to your overall health. So we need to make that liaison with your physician and we want to make sure that it is safe to undergo surgical intervention. Um, and we, we need to work with your physician to make sure that you're healthy enough to proceed uh, dental treatment. And that's what I, I, I highly um, uh, express to my patients and, and motivate them to, to, to seek out medical care. Because honestly, we, 
I see patients sometimes that tell me that they haven't gone to their physician in five years, yet they go and um, seek dental treatment. We're the first line sometimes, um, you know, of care for patients. So it's our responsibility to make sure that they have um, optimum health, overall health as well. Great. And it might be that the mouth is actually the barometer of the body. You know, if the mouth is happy, the rest of the body's happy. You know, we use analogies like the canary in the mine shaft. Um, I, I must say, I have often in my treatment of persons with diabetes left the mouth out, but no longer going forward. Great. And um, one thing I did want to touch on before we're going to fire through some questions uh, uh, that are out there is, you know, this is an individual issue with all of our patients, but it's also a national issue. This is quite literally uh, a massive suck on our healthcare dollars. And it's dollars that we, we don't want to spend because those dollars mean that there's complications happening with our diabetic community, which, as Dr. Miller referenced, is only going to grow. Um, and I just want to give folks some some stats. And Katie, if you could throw up some sites as we go. We, I won't go through them too deeply, but I do want people to have access to them if, if they'd like. Um, there's studies, I'll, I'll list some. Jeff Coat, uh, throw up the Jeff Coat study from 2014, where they studied almost uh, more than 300,000, 330,000 individuals. Uh, and what they found was that patients with type 2 diabetes who had periodontal disease uh, treatment they lowered their, their overall medical costs by 40%, 40%. And the, 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 Smith, the Smith study, throw that up there, please, for them. Uh, that was a, a total of over 41,000 individuals. They found savings of over 30% in diabetes-related costs following periodontal treatment versus no perio treatment. There's a study by uh, put out by the ADA, NASA, Marco Vujovic, who's a terrific uh, person, by the way, in 2016, there'd be a net savings of more than $1,300 in total medical costs over two years for diabetics who receive periodontal treatment versus those who don't. There's an Adelier study from 2016, they're, a, they're a, a policy institute, that if Medicare, which doesn't cover dental, Medicare doesn't cover dental. And there's a group, there's a consortium of us, there's 140 groups, it's American Diabetes Association, AARP, Pacific Dental Services Foundation, a whole host of folks, the Santa Fe group, uh, who has been advocating for this just for medically necessary. We're just trying to say that. And if you just had periodontal disease care for patients uh, with um, uh, heart disease, diabetes, or had had a stroke, we would save massively conservative number, more than $60 billion in healthcare spend over 10 years. And of course, I'm talking like dollars. It's not about the dollars. It's about patients actually being healthier. That's why it's less expensive. By the way, the, the insurance companies, I saw the, 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 the comments about the insurance companies, absolutely, they know it too. So United Concordia said there's an annual savings of over $2,800. Again, these are patients with diabetes who get periodontal disease treatment versus not. That was almost a 40% reduction in, oh, but by the way, and a 39.4% reduction in hospital admissions. Massive. Cigna says there's over $1,200 to be saved. Aetna, improved diabetes control by 45%. So those who asked, you know, what needs to happen? What needs to happen is we need to be able to spend more money in oral health care. And it's not because it's the money. It's because you spend a dollar there, you save the dollar on medical. Medical is where the massive costs are. The massive cost to our healthcare system treating diabetes is on the medical side and the medical folks know it. That's why we're doing this. And I think you've all seen the passion that Dr. Zuli and Dr. Miller and Dr. Uh, Eden have is because we see this and we know it every day and it's frustrating. So that's why we're doing everything we can. And we're hoping at the end of this, there'll be 1500 people who similarly are trying to figure out on a local level, because not all of us meet with the CDC. So on a local level is, hey, how do we bring this all together? Because uh, it's one patient at a time, but for our country and our national healthcare system and, uh, and, our, and our community, uh, a massive growing community of diabetics, this is tremendously important. 
So, and I really think we're at a pivotal time for that because what you guys are experiencing on the dental level, we're experiencing at the medical level. We often say 98% of the healthcare dollar for ambulances to pick up people after falling off a cliff. And only 2% is spent on preventing people from falling off the cliff. Uh, and so that's a bit of a reactive disease management. It's starting to pivot. It's not quite there yet. Some of it is because the medical model or the dental model isn't congruent with the business model. There are quarterly metrics were a lifetime metric. And so how do you marry that? Uh, you know, you mentioned a dollar spent in the dental world saves a dollar in the medical world. I think it saves $100 in the medical world. And, and that's often a hard thing to position. And I think one of the ways we start to uh, impact that is a bit of what you're doing, Dan, in the world with looking at um, uh, uh, Medicare and Medicaid. A lot of the insurance companies follow it. Uh, but the problem is, is somebody has to move first. And, and you get this a lot. I've testified many times before insurance companies and they say, yes, but if we cover all these preventative and all these things, and then, then we're going to get all the sick people. And I say, do you understand the hamster cage is a finite thing? Everybody lives in the hamster cage. When you, you know, as an insurance company, you know, offloads a group of at-risk patients and you get in new patients, they're not, they're in the same hamster cage. And, and that's what it's going to have to take is we're all going to have to do a, a pivot at the same time. And you are absolutely correct. Uh, we will spend a dollar and save a, a hundred to a thousand times that. And that's what's going to have to happen. And it's slow. But if we all start saying the same thing, I think they'll have to pivot. Great. So, um, uh, Jed, feel free to throw up the, the code uh, anytime. It's convenient for you. Uh, and again, folks, you'll go to CE Zoom and enter that code so you get your CE. So there's a whole bunch of questions. Let's see how many we can get to. Um, let's see. Um, some of these I think we've asked, answered, which is awesome. So does insurance cover A1C tests in dental practice? Yes, they do. Uninhibited. Yes, uh, you can do it as often as you want there. You know, occasionally I'll hear somebody say, oh, it's only every three months, every six months. Nope. In fact, the rapid A1C machine that I use, that's Clea Wave, the Athenian, I'm not putting a plug for it. It's just one of the very best one. It's the manufacturers of Abbott. You know, they do other testing such as the COVID and you probably have other testing as well. Um, there, you know, even a cash pay cost for that is roughly, you know, 16 for the card and then whatever you want to do for draw fee. It's pretty cheap, even in a cash pay system, you could easily, you know, do 20 to $25 and still make some uh, off of it in terms of your time. Uh, but the, the codes, you know, E11.6 you know, or 11.9 for type two or E10.6, 10.9 for type one, uh, they will cover them. There is no limit on it. So you shouldn't be getting this oh, I already had one, you know, this year, or oh, I had one yesterday from my, from my provider or whatever. You should be fine. Great. And for some folks, um, if you try to bill uh, dental and you don't see a place, dentists in dental practice can bill medical. Yep. So you can't yeah, build those codes I gave you were the ICD-10 codes, uh, E11.6 uh, for uh, uncontrolled, E11.9 for type 2, E10.6 for type 1 uncontrolled, E10.9 for type two, uh, 1 well controlled. Great. Um, how about compliance? That seems to be a question, right? Non-compliant patients. I'm sure, Dr. Eden, you've never heard of such a thing or Dr. Zuli. Any... They're all great. <laughs> exactly. So anything, say, Dr. Zuli, that you, uh, excuse me, Dr. Uh, Eden, that you'd love to have happen in a dental practice where many patients go to the dental uh, uh, office. I, Delta Dental just did a big survey of how many people are planning to go to the dental practice to go back to the dental office this year after some didn't last year. It's a massive number. So anything that- Myself included. What can hygienists One of the do? things that I think is a challenge for my for all of us colleagues is keeping patients engaged. Patient engagement is tough. And I will tell you that we've done a lot of research in this field, and this is where we're going to put our own egos and opinions aside. We often are fairly uh, quick to kind of answer for patients what, what they're going through. When I see very, very high lack of engagement, 
uh, that indicates that their distress is very, very high. I call it diabetes distress scale. There is one out there. You don't have to fill out another form. But when I see an individual who is unengaged in any of their healthcare treatment, any of their diabetes related treatment, I don't even sit there and say, you know, we ought to do better. Uh, I say to them, you know, I'm really concerned about you. I notice that you're not taking your, you know, really care and doing some of the things we talked about. What's going on with your life? If you put that aside and really deal with it from more of a mental health issue, no, I don't want you to become, <laughs> you're all Freudian psychologists now, they're all laying down flat. So, you know, but, but just to mention it and say, oftentimes lack of engagement is really a very high level of diabetes distress and they just disengage because they become apathetic and very, very afraid. And so one of the things you're gonna have to do because it feels like you're going to be taking what you suggest and really, pulling it back, uh, I say to them, what is one thing you can do or you would feel uh, equipped to do or have the energy to do that might change a little bit of that trajectory today? Uh, instead of saying you need to do this and this and this and this and this is you know meeting them where they're at. And I'm sure you guys have the same motivational interview in, in regards to dental. So I'll let Dr. Zuli comment as well. Absolutely. In fact, we have to talk about this with our patients. Um, all the time, just because periodontal disease is a chronic infection. And unfortunately, they're asymptomatic most of the time until it becomes very severe. And then they start having uh, bone loss and, and tooth loss. So we oftentimes have to make sure that we educate our patients and be sympath sympathetic of um, the fact that they're scared that they have an infection in their mouth and that it can, um, you know, damage other organ systems and just educate them as kindly as possible. So they understand that we have to lower the bacterial load and just look out for their best interests. So um, education is key, kindness and um, trying to educate them as well to go to their physician to make sure it's a whole comprehensive type of approach to their health, not just oral. Um, and, and that's some things that I really focus on during uh, my consultations with our patients. Yeah, you know, one last uh, ta uh, other thing I do with that is I like to do analogies because you take something somebody does every day and you discuss them. I often use the statement, don't emotionalize your disease. When you emotionalize your disease, you create barriers to your own treatment. And so I'll tease them sometimes like a, a, a person will not check their sugar. And I said, did you drive here today? Not even looking at your speedometer. I have an idea. Let's go outside and put a sticky on your gas gauge and not look at it whether you're good or bad. It's a metric that I need to follow in order to make decisions. And so I tease them about it. I do different things. I make make things that they do every day and incorporate the diabetes management. And I say, I know it's hard. It's like a two year old that never stops crying. You know, eventually you just give up because you know, it's there all the time. Great. You know, this is a rather specific question. So in case you have heard of it, there's a couple of comments about stannous fluoride and that diabetics mm -hmm. shouldn't use them. I had not heard that. Has that come across your radar screen, Dr. Zuli, by chance? I there's not a lot of it, uh, literature that supports that, at least on my end. I mm -hmm. have heard of it, but I would love to look into that. Okay, great. Thanks for the I don't even know what stannous fluoride is. I don't, I don't. <laughs> Cavities, yeah. There you go. <laughs> Excellent. I, I always say don't sweat the small stuff. Uh, don't sweat the small stuff, do the big stuff. You know, intervene Absolutely. in the big stuff. You know, you get the nuances. I love the nuances. As as providers, you guys are fine to do the nuances, but don't miss the big stuff. The big stuff are key. The small stuff is the art that you do in your practice. Great. A number of comments and questions had to do with just, you know, what are medical colleagues taught and not taught? And I, um, there are some academics listening, uh, I happen to know. And uh, first, I, I so I have to give them a shout out or I'll get bad text. But it, at Harvard uh, School, uh, Harvard, NYU, I know a University of Pacific, they are actually having students on, uh, who are going for the medical degree and, and dental actually working together and in wow. classroom together. Uh, UAP is actually building a, a, a shared uh, clinic where they'll actually work together. I believe NYU actually already has that and sees uh, many patients. So shout outs to them. Um, so are they outliers? Let me ask both of you. Is that, are they, are they outliers now? Are they, are they actually leading or is this something that is common or uncommon? Where this I think is it's emerging. It, it mm -hmm. appears to be emerging. I can tell you from my standpoint, I'm, I'm not a young physician anymore. I'm in middle age. 
Um, I could probably tell you I had one to two hours of overall dental training, uh, which to me is incredibly substandard. The other thing I would suggest is, you know, we've been, we're coming together in the middle. Um, we would love to see your colleagues come to our CEs uh, and to start presenting things on our side of our medical organizations for continuing ed. Um, you know, not that I'm the gatekeeper, but, you know, we invite you to do that and to create inroads because then you can catch some of our older providers up. Uh, some of the younger kids are getting a much broader multidisciplinary training. My experience has been that we did take um, several classes with our medical colleagues. Um, and I, I feel like we had to take physiology. We had to take um, all of the uh, medical training in order for us to receive our DMD. After third year, then we had our, our scope of practice was more limited to clinic per se. But we our first and second year, it was all medicine. Um, and I, I wish that we could have more interaction with our medical colleagues during um, education. I, I can say that we did have several classes together, um, but not as much as I would have liked. Yeah. Great. Uh, there's a couple of questions about other oral systemic links, heart and others. Just a call out for folks. Um, if you're looking in, if you're looking for more CE on CE Zoom uh, and through uh, Crest Oral B, we've this is the third installment. So we've done two prior. So feel free to go back. They're recorded. Uh, one uh, is is terrific. Has uh, Dr. Amy Donine of the Bale Donine Institute, uh, who is you know this is her expertise on the connectivity between. Uh, the oral cavity and uh, cardiovascular disease. And Victoria Sampson is on there as well. It also has to do with COVID, uh, which is uh, remarkable that some of you called out, why isn't this stuff on Good Morning America, et cetera. Um, it's still remarkable to me that it didn't get picked up here in this country is the connectivity between periodontal disease and how serious uh, COVID manifested itself. So you won't, you're not more likely to get COVID if you have periodontal disease, but if you ha get COVID and you have periodontal disease, the the bugs in the mouth that become you know catalyzed that that that, that the storm that happens and goes into the lungs uh, is, is remarkable. The connection it's well known in Europe again earmuffs for all of us, but Europeans were ahead of us on this one. Uh, but anyway, so just a little commercial to to on CE Zoom and and for the website from uh, Crest Oral B, you get CE by watching that. And there's a, the first one uh, was rather extensive. It was the introduction to oral systemic health. Uh, so we had folks like Dr. Jack Dillenberg on there and talking about um, uh, connection with oral health with dementia, Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, mm -hmm. uh, just sort of a, a, a whole introduction to the topic. And now, as you can tell, we've gotten a little bit more specific. So you're welcome to check those out. Um, so sort of last thing for, for Dr. Eden, and I know says some folks who are listening, and by the way, a, a number of the folks on the line are actually diabetics themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanna recognize that, and they very much appreciate that you're speaking not just as an academic and a practitioner, but as a patient. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, they, they've asked, you know, speaking either as a diabetic patient or as an MD, you know, sort of sum up if you could, what do you want, what do you want them to know? Like as a takeaway, we've had 90 minutes, there's a ton of information. At the end of it, sometimes people want to hear. So this one thing you want me to remember, Dr. Miller, what would it be? You know, the patient needs to be at the center of this. You're going to bring your own knowledge and science to it. And it's okay. Don't be apologetic for that. Uh, understand that when you pay, put the patient first and you put your knowledge of the disease first, you will always win. And don't let anything erode that, even if they're, you know, yeah, we have barriers of payers and different bureaucracies and different, you know, administrative, you know, this is how we do it. If you have those two allegiances and you learn about a disease state, just like just like I'm learning about the mouth and I'm learning things that I don't have and I'm being taught, I'm incorporating that into my knowledge base. And so I always say, if you're allegiant to the disease and to the patient, you'll always win. And then if we have that as a shared objective, and if we can come together, we might see things from different perspectives, but if we can come together for the patient, that's all that matters. Because we're coming at it from different things and we're coming as a common thing. And so having these conversations like this, remember we're scientists, we're very autonomous, we're a little bit egocentric, 
We're a little bit isolationist. And what I'm really thinking we need to do is we need to collaborate. We need to have fun. We need to kid with each other, learn from each other and make it an enjoyable process, not a competition. And if we need to put that patient in the center and how we sit there and, and commiserate, I think it's great. Fantastic. Dr. Zuli, close us, bring us home. You've, you've, you, you, um, you earned the right to have the privilege of working at Mayo Clinic where you, where you were immersed in this. If there's one thing that you'd have people remember from today, what would that be? Integrative medicine, as Dr. Miller um, mentioned, we put this patient at the center so we can make sure that we comprehensively treat the patient. And yes, um, the mouth is the gateway to our overall health. However, we want to make sure that we open the lines of communication and we, um, we work with our colleagues so we can make sure that the patient is not just treated um, uh, in, in in the scope of um, oral infection or oral disease, but just how it manifests throughout the whole body. So um, keeping the, the patient centered and we want to make sure that we emphasize integrative medicine and open the lines of communication with our colleagues. Brilliant. Brilliant. So to the audience members out there, first, uh, compliment you. Thanks for staying on. Uh, you may not know this and you may not care, but we do because we have big egos. No, I'm just kidding. But um, this uh, webinar series has broken all the records and uh, you did it again. And what's not just coming on and saying, oh, it's free CE, but you've stayed on. I mean, you did not need to stay on past that verification code. And we have more than a thousand people who have stayed on. So thank you for your commitment to the topic. We really appreciate it. Um, and, and two requests for you. One, we have another one uh, that we'll be planning. If you have out there uh, a topic, you know, what's our next oral systemic topic, right? So we had the general, we had COVID, we have some cardiovascular, and now we're focused on diabetes. What do you want the next one to be? We're going to put up a slide with our contact information. Let me know. I'd love to hear uh, what more you want to hear a deep dive in on. And thank you very much. This really was a uh, a large conversation. Their comments were phenomenal. Uh, I think you also broke records for the amount of engage the levels of engagement you stayed on and you commented. Uh, so thank you. We learned a ton from you as well. So Jed, I think we're good. Dr. Zuli, Dr. Eden, thank you very, very much. Uh, you've invested far more than just the 90 minutes today. And uh, with all the things pulling on you, um, just very, very much appreciated. Uh, thanks for your dedication every day to your patients and thanks for all your help for all of us today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me to your crowd. Cheers. Honored. <laughs> thanks everybody. Cheers. <laughs>